came on? No snow in Ottawa. I'm just waiting until it loads. Hello, everyone. Okay, we are up now. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Insider's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, as I said to our Zoom viewers, I am apologizing in advance. I am having some internet issues today, so I am on my mobile data. Um, so I'm going to turn off my camera once I let Chris get started. So that's my quality will be better next uh, Insider's Guide. Um, before we get started, a couple cool announcements from National is National uh, RASC is going to be at the Outdoor Adventure Trade and Travel Show in Toronto, well, Mississauga, this weekend. So if you're in the GTA um, and just are into the outdoor stuff and want to swing by, I think it's only $20 for the whole weekend and $14 for a day. Come say hi. You might get some swag from RASC as well. Um, and also another thing we have coming up on the national end of things is we are hosting a live um, webinar on May 9th, International Astronomy Day. And it's going to start off with a pre-recorded talk with David St. Jacques, as well as then we're going to tune in live for a Q&A at the um, Planetarium in Montreal where you'll have a chance to submit questions. And then we're gonna go into seeing live views of the moon and some pre-recorded and just celebrate Canada and RASC and the moon and astronomy and have a nice big party. And we're also, so with that, if you have any feelings about the new moon mission and you wanna share it with us in a video that you would like to be featured, check out rasca slash shooting dash moon dash webinar. And we're looking for content to include to represent RASC members there, because this is a party for you to feature how great everyone is in the astronomy community in Canada. So that's my little spiel. And, uh, and so I'm going to let Chris get started with a very fun episode today. Thank you. Yeah, so what we're going to do, we're mainly going to focus on diving into LEO today. And I like to do these deep dives. Samantha and I were talking before the show about these deep dives. What's great about learning a lot of extra detail about a constellation is that, you know, it's good to have fun facts at your fingertips. If you're doing public outreach or you're at a star party or just with friends and family, you can point to that star and say, hey, did you know that it's this distance away or that it's spinning super fast or it has a hot Jupiter orbiting it, things like that. So those spoiler alert, those are some of the things that I'll be mentioning today. And we'll go into some of the really cool things that you need telescopes for and some things that you'll do imaging for. So, uh, but before we do that, I want to share my screen and just um, highlight some breaking news. And then we'll do our quick Messier minute section and then we'll get into Leo. So let me just open up my Stellarium here. So in case you haven't heard, uh, this week, is the best week to see Mercury for us in Canada, mid-northern latitudes for all of 2022 in the evening sky. And this is the sky tonight at 9 p.m. looking west-northwest. And if you have a chance, if your skies are clear to the west, make an effort to get out there and you can spot Mercury should have no trouble finding it. It should be nice and bright. It's already um, brighter than magnitude zero, it's just a bit under magnitude zero. It's still not finished, it's still getting better. So every week that every day that goes on this week, it's gonna get high, a little higher and a little higher, higher. It'll finally reach its greatest elongation, I think on the weekend or so. And while it's doing that, it's actually giving uh, paying a visit to the Pleiades cluster. So let me just zoom in a little bit. There is this comet pan stars in the neighborhood as well, but it's twilight. So I don't think we're gonna get a good look at the comet. It's just setting as it gets dark. But yeah, if you want to take a look at Mercury buzzing past the Pleiades, that's going to happen April 30th, May 1st, kind of three or four days worth of close. Now, the, because the Pleiades is so big, it's tough to fit them both in a telescope view, you know, even with a really low power eyepiece. Um, it can be a challenge to fit them all together, but you can definitely fit Mercury and part of the Pleiades cluster in, the, in sight at the same time. So try to get out there. You know, if you get yourself set up around nine, you should be able to spot Mercury then or soon after that. 
And uh, any clear night this week, head on out and take a look. So that's my sort of uh, little heads up for something to, to look, cool to look at in the way of bucket list information. Um, also, there's a uh, the next new moon, which happens on, on Sunday, a Saturday to Sunday, is a partial solar eclipse, which won't be visible around here. It'll be visible in uh, sort of the coast of Antarctica and Tierra del Fuego part of the world. But um, you can always um, watch a live stream of that. So a couple little things to whet your appetite for what's newsy. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to bring up the Messier list objects here, and we'll go through our Messier minutes. So we're we're marching along quite nicely doing our uh, our spring targets. We've pretty much done the, the lion's share of the spring targets, if you pardon the expression. And this week, we're going to just clean up a few leftovers that we didn't get to when we talked about the the messy objects that were in the Virgo cluster region here between Virgo and Leo. And first up on the list I've got noted here is Messier 49. So you can see that um, two messy objects, 49 and 61, are located due south of the main clump. So this is where your Markarian's chain galaxies are and things like that. So 49, just bring this into the center here and zoom in on it a little bit. So again, I'm simulating a view using a six inch Dobsonian telescope, reflector telescope, and a nice common low power eyepiece, 26 millimeter plossal eyepiece. If you've got, you know, a shorter focal length, you'll be able to zoom in and make it bigger. But, you know, this combination gives you a nice healthy one and a half degree field of view. So it makes finding the objects uh, a little bit easier to do that. So M49, as you can see, it's magnitude 8.3. It's uh, south of the main cluster. Um, the way I like to recommend people find it is that it's actually on the line connecting um, Minileva, which is this star. No, where, where are we here, Minileva? There, Minileva and Denebola. So there's our, there's our tail of Leo. And if you connect a vector between these two, you'll see that M49 is right on that line. And it's, uh, it's about 40% of the way between Minileva and Denebola. So a little bit closer to the Virgo star than the uh, Leo star. Um, this one is visible in good binoculars. It's bright enough for good binoculars um, and smaller telescopes. And if you've got bigger apertures, then you can start looking for, you know, it'll grow bigger in size. It's an elliptical, so you're not going to get a lot of extra details with a bigger aperture telescope, but you can do that. Um, you can also look for uh, other galaxy nearby. So we've got the NGC 45. 35 spiral face on spiral galaxy nicknamed the lost galaxy of Copeland in the same neighborhood. So if I were to say click on a star here and put it into my um, my reflect my Dobsonian reflector, you can see that we can pick up in the same field of view um, several these other two galaxies in the neighborhood of M49. So we've got the hairy eyebrow galaxy and the um, lost galaxy of Copeland. And then if you've got a really dark sky and a big telescope, you can look for all kinds of other galaxies in the neighborhood. So M61, M61, you can find, um, my recommendation is to use um, that Minilauva star and New Virginis. So if you pick the upraised arm of Virgo and draw a line down to that middle of a star. It's kind of halfway along that line joining those two stars. So that will get you in the neighborhood. M61 is a small, but very pretty face on spiral galaxy. Um, it can, it's not really binoculars target, but it's visible in smaller telescopes where you'll, you'll get the central brighter sections. Larger instrument, you'll start maybe teasing out some details in the spiral arm set. Um, let's see. Yeah, and this one's known for growing with averted vision. So that's why its nickname is the spelling, the swelling spiral galaxy. So if you look straight at it, you'll, you'll notice the core more. And if you look to the side with averted vision, then you'll notice the arms more. So that's a neat one. And just to give you the comparison, that's how it would look in that Dobsonian reflector telescope. Okay, next up, we're going to jump up into Coma, another outlier, and go into Messier 64. Coma, the Messier 64 is not 
near really any any signposts or easy things to use but one of the tricks you can use is to try to see if you can see the three main stars of Coma Berenices here and if you draw a vector across the hypotenuse then you're going to be close if you sort of stick to the you know 40 percent of the distance from the bottom to the top and uh, find that if you're using a low power eyepiece you should have no trouble um, putting it into the view if you do that this is a um, called the black eye galaxy it's um, out of an obliquely tilted spiral galaxy it's nicknamed the black eye it comes from dark dust that's in the center. I'll just zoom in here. Um, this is a kind of an enhanced Hubble view. If I put on the deep sky survey image, you'll get a more realistic, um, you know, rascal sort of view. This one's about 24 million light years away. So if you have the, a bigger aperture, you might be able to start teasing out some of the, the, the details in the black eye, which is a dark dust lane kind of in the core. All right, and then next up is M104. So M104, where's our M104 here? Down lower. That's right. <laughs> That's right, it's a low one. There we go. I just made the finder charts. That's the M104, only reason I know. Yeah. So M104 <laughs> is down there, even farther away from the, uh, the Virgo cluster. It's down there between Crater, and Virgo and Corvus. So M104 is a great one though, even though it's kind of low for Canadians uh, or lower for Canadians. This is the Sombrero Galaxy with the dark dust lane running through the middle. So this is a great one. Um, quite bright, magnitude eight. So that's, that's because of its high surface brightness. So all of the starlight's being sort of gathered into a, a narrow zone, a lozenge shaped so I'm giving it a, an overall bigger brightness. That'll let you see it in big binoculars, smaller telescopes. And then if you got, if you have more aperture, then you could start seeing if you could pick out the dark dust lane bisecting the two sort of sections of the galaxy. To find that one, I make an isosceles triangle with Spica and Porima on the bottom side of Virgo here. So Spica, you will have no trouble identifying. So just sort of, build yourself a triangle using those, and you should be able to pick it up. Again, it's nice and bright, so it shouldn't have any trouble seeing it. Uh, that one's about 29 million light years away. This one's actually receding from us at a very high velocity and an anomalously high velocity. And there's actually a neat asterism right up here that you can pick out in the eyepiece. So there's a neat asterism of stars. It kind of looks like a garden, a garden hose sprayer nozzle with the hose coming up and the, the gun and the then the trigger. So see if, you, see if you can pick that one up. And last up is M83, which is even lower. And M83 is going to be better later in the evening, so towards midnight. And this one is the Southern Pinwheel Galaxy. And this one eh, can be a little tricky to find if you can't see the star Menkent. Menkent's a great um, tool for finding it because if you can spot Menkent, then you can draw a vector up from that up to the two fainter stars at the tip of Hydra. And it's about halfway between those two. But this one is a gorgeous, gorgeous, another gorgeous face on spiral galaxy. Let me just put it in the colossal eyepiece again. Um, transits around midnight, as I said, you should be able to get it in binoculars, although you know you're looking through quite a bit of air mass for us in Canada if you're. Uh, folks that live further south would have more of, a, of an advantage. It'll be higher in the sky for them. Um, so small telescopes will pick the center, but then uh, a larger aperture telescope will let you start noticing the spiral arms. And you'll notice that they're not, um, they're not symmetrical. There's some asymmetry to this. So we'd look for, see if you can tease out some of the structure when you're looking for it, some darker patches. Some of these dark dust lanes that are kind of internal um, can add some some texture, some modeling to the overall effect. So that one's about 15 million light years away. So those are our messiers for, for now. In two weeks, we've got a moon filled night. So we'll, we'll focus on some of the uh, brighter objects in the um, messier catalog 
for late spring, early summer, but that's the Messiers for now. We do, so we do a couple of questions um, about Mercury. I'm sorry, I missed these earlier. Uh, one no is what makes Mercury so remarkable these next couple weeks? Oh, what, well, what the reason I'm highlighting it is because it's, it's so easily visible for a change. So normally, um, quite often when Mercury swings east of the sun, it's in the evening sky. But often when it does that, its orbit is quite, um, quite a bit tilted with respect to the plane of the solar system. I'm not sure if it reports here the, the inclination of the orbit. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it puts Mercury quite a bit to the north or quite a bit to the south of the ecliptic quite often. And so a lot of times, you know, the ecliptic will be more slanted, plus Mercury will be south of it or below it, and it just doesn't climb very high in the sky. But for us at this time of the year, it's nice and wide east of the sun. It's on the north side of a, of a fairly upright ecliptic, so it just makes it the uh, more extra visible for us. So that's why I'm highlighting it for you. A lot of, you know, Mercury only sticks around for, sometimes it's a week and a half, sometimes it's two or three weeks, but you know, it's kind of a bucket list thing that people like to chase after. So that's my reasoning. And just to remind us, uh, what time can you start to see the Mer to see Mercury? Yeah, so at nine o'clock, you get a nice balance between the darkening sky and the, the, the planet. If you wanna use um, binoculars, you can search for it earlier. It'll be a little higher, but please make sure the sun is completely set before you point anything like binoculars or a telescope to the West. So, you know, even as late, say as, as early as 8.30, you might be able to start looking for it. At 8.30, it'll be about 1.3 outstretched fists above the horizon. And if you can't see it then, just give yourself a few minutes. With every passing minute, it gets easier. And one more time gets, question before we move in. Yeah, by the time you get to 9.30, you're kind of getting really tough. So nine o'clock is your prime target. Sorry, go ahead. Good early evening target. Um, someone's quickly at uh, one more before we move on. Our planet's fairly consistent in sky year by year. Um, well, we've been teaching this in NOVA, I'll let Chris elaborate, but uh, one of the reasons you don't really have it on your planetarium or sky charts is because they change so often when they're up and when they're visible. So you don't have them on those printed charts. Um, Chris, what can you elaborate a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, they're always in motion. So, um, you know, you can't rely on, you can't rely on seeing them at the same time every year because they're on a completely different, different um, schedule than we are. You know, we're, we're, we return to the same skies, the same stars, on the same dates every year, year after year after year, but their years are all different amounts. So they, you know, Mercury swings around the sun every 88 days. So it's, it, 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 it toggles between the morning and evening sky on a, on, a, on a pattern or on a schedule that's just not consistent with our calendar. So it always varies. You know, for example, right now, um, Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, and Venus, they're all in the pre-dawn sky. That's just the luck of it. We don't have any other, when Mercury disappears here in a couple of weeks, we're back to no planets in the evening sky until Saturn arrives in late June. Thank you. And one more thing, as Judy said, if you're looking for when they're going to be visible, things such as that, the Observer's Handbook, look for the most current edition, and it will give you all the charts of um, the movement of motion of the planets and when you can see the best and things yep. like that. Or, or you can just tune into the sky and we'll tell you. <laughs> and Sky News too. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of resources. Okay. Um, let's get started in a deep dive into Leo. All right. So Leo is a great constellation to focus on because it's so distinctive and consists, consists of, you know, lots of bright stars that makes recognizing its pattern nice and easy for most people. Um, a lot of cultures in the past recognized a lion in these stars. Um, some, of the, uh, some of the sky charts you see will show Leo in this form. So we've got this sort of sickle backwards question mark shape 
for his head and neck and chest, and then a triangle for his, uh, his rear end. Um, some, some representations of the constellation add legs. So you can see there are, there are one or two stars, you know, brighter than, brighter than average stars below him. And so if you open up Stellarium, you can go into your star lore and you can pick from any number of different ways of connecting the dots. So here's the H.A. Ray. He's the gentleman that, that created Curious George and he wrote this great book called The Stars. So he connects the dots in a different way to make it more lion shaped. If you go to say some of the ancient Arabic astronomy, and then you can also bring up in Stellarium, you can bring up the different versions of the artwork. But a lot of cultures have seen a lion in those stars. Um, there is a possibility that the, the Mesopotamians or, um, identified those stars back as early as 4000 BC. The, the Babylonians uh, created artwork with the lion as, as uh, long ago as 1000 BC. And then, you know, the Greeks and Romans and so on have picked it up since then. Um, in terms of the American indigenous people, you know, the, um, the Lakota Dakota people saw actually the curve of the sickle as, let me just bring that one up here. Dakota, Lakota. As kind of a hearth or fire pit. So that curve of stars. Whereas the, uh, the um, Ojibwe Anishinaabe people of the Great Lakes region, they call it um, a guide, no, guide in a way, which I'm not speaking, not pronouncing very well, but the English translation is curly tail. So instead of the lion going, the rest of the line being off to the east, they're connecting the curve of the sickle as the curly tail of the puma and connecting it with some other stars to the west. And the, the neat story about that, and you know, you can go on to um, Jody and Isaac's resource to get some information about the indigenous teachings around curly tail. But the, the short brief version of that is that when you see the, the sickle of Leo or the curly tail of the panther, um, it's meant to be a, a spirit that lives in the bottom of the lakes. And when you see it in the sky, it's a reminder to everyone that the waterways are melting, the ice is melting on the waterways and to be, you know, to stay off the, the melting lakes and rivers. All right, so let's go back to our Western version of it. So yeah, even from the suburbs, Leo is pretty easy to recognize. It's, it's got this, Big star Regulus that can that can lead you to the way, and then Denebola, which is another bright star, anchors it at the other end. It's situated at this time of the year, around 10 p.m., high in the southern sky. So there's the zenith here. It's bordered uh, on the zodiac by Cancer and Virgo, east and west, and then it's got uh, Leo Minor, the little line above it. A piece of Ursa Major connects the boundary here. You've got Coma Berenices. On the, on the left hand side, and then uh, part of sextans um, at the bottom center. There's a, the, the constellation itself is about, let's see, I've got, it's 12th largest by area, including all of the extra pieces that you see in the boundary here. It's about 29 degrees though, um, east to west for the bright stars, and about 14 degrees north south. But yeah, as I said, the area allocated, allotted to Leo, is a lot bigger than that. Um, um, you'll notice that if you sort of put binoculars on this piece that sticks out to the bottom, to the south, there's kind of a ring of stars here, faint stars. And so I'm gonna nickname this the lion's den from, uh, for the rest of our time. So that's cool. Um, okay, I'll come, back to, I'll come back to a bit about coma here in a minute. So let's talk a little bit about each of the individual stars. Um, by the way, because Leo is sitting near the ecliptic, you know, it tends to be visible across lots of the world. And so it's well known all around them. All right, so let's, let, let's talk about these stars one by one. So Regulus is gonna be our anchor point. Regulus is the bottom of this backwards question mark. It's Alpha Leonis. It's about magnitude 1.35. It's about 79 light years away. In uh, its name, Regulus is, arises from an Arabic expression for little king, well, little king in Latin. 
and its Arabic name was uh, Kalb al-Assad, which translates to the heart of the lion. So we're actually using its uh, Latin name, but you can see in Stellarium, we've got the uh, Arabic and other names here as well. It's a blue-white star. It's got a nice little companion nearby. So if you use your binoculars or your, your telescope, you can pick up its secondary star nearby. Um, the star Regulus is frequently occulted by the moon because the moon travels close to the ecliptic. So that's kind of a neat, some neat aspects of Regulus. Moving up from there, the next star up here is al -Jaba. So al -Jaba is um, also Eta Leonis. It's a medium bright white star. It's about a palm's width above Regulus. It's about 20,000 times more luminous than our sun is. But because it's so far away, it's 1,270 light years away from us. You know, it appears, it shines relatively modestly in the sky. But um, you should be able to pick it up even from the suburbs, especially, you know, with your naked eyes, but maybe even with them, um, especially with binoculars. Up from there, we've got Algeba, and already you can see below Algeba, there's a little star named 40 Leonis. So as a kind of a naked eye or binoculars double star, Algeba is, is really popular for that. The name Algeba means the forehead, and this is a K1 class star. So it's kind of a, um, kind of a, warm, a warm, creamy color. And in a telescope, it splits. So we've got the 40 and Algeba here, but if I actually zoom in even closer to that, we'll see Algeba splits into a pair of stars. So the two stars are gold yellow for one of them and say greenish or yellowish for the second one. Um, one is about twice as bright as the other. We know that uh, a hot Jupiter style planet is orbiting Algeba, the primary star. Next up from there, we've got Adafara, which is the uh, from the Arabic expression for the braid or the curl, referring to the lion's mane. And it's an FO class star, so that gives it a kind of a warm white color. And it has these two bright companions nearby, so 39 and 35 Leonis. So you should be able to, you might be able to see those naked eye, but you can definitely pick them up in binoculars. Next up, we've got Rosalis, so Rasalis, that's Mu Leonis. So Rosalis is, comes from an expression which means the lion's head, lion's head towards the south. So it's, a, it's an abbreviated word from uh, Al Raz, Al Assad, Al Shamali, which means the lion's head towards the south. It's a K2 class star, a bit yellow tinted. It's sun mass, so it's got the mass of the sun as our sun. But it's been, uh, with age, it's swollen and cooled down. So it's a cooler star, but it's actually quite a large radius to that star. It's about 125 light years away. And it is also known to be orbited by a hot Jupiter-style planet. All right, and finally, at the end of the sickle or the question mark, we have Alganubi. So Alganubi, uh, or uh, Raz Alad Australis, means the beast's nose or the southern star of the lion's head. And it's a G1 class star, so not far off um, the class of our own sun, a yellowish star, 247 light years away. And uh, it's actually one of the most luminous stars in the constellation, but it's, um, it's extincted by intervening gas and dust, which are blocking its light a little bit and dimming it as more than it should be. Now, those are the big primary stars in the sickle that are labeled in Stellarium. But if you go up a little bit more, there's some other stars nearby. So we've got Alturf, and Alturf's gonna come back to uh, something I'm gonna talk about in a little while. So Alturf is Lambda Leonis. It's a magnitude 4.3 star. It's kind of reddish in color. And it comes from the Arabic phrase for um, uh, the view of the lion. So it's, it's a large cool, cooled off star. And then if you are interested in similar stars, so the sort of reddish tinted stars, there's a couple more of those down near Regulus. So there's 31 Leonis and Pi Leonis are similar to that, sort of the red tinted stars. 
And finally, up here, we've got one more in the neighborhood, Almin Liar al Assad, or Kappa Leonis. And this is actually translates literally to the lion's nose. So it's a binary star system. We have a magnitude uh, 4.46 primary star, kind of a K-class star. And then there's a magnitude 10 secondary. So let me just zoom in here a little bit. See if you can pick up on that. Um, you can't always rely on Stellarium to properly uh, display the, the double and triple stars um, that you'll see in the eyepiece. There are a few errors here and there that you'll find. But this star is about uh, 200 light years away. So those are the stars on the western side of the constellation. The stars on the eastern side of the constellation are this Before trio. Move on, sorry, we have a question about the uh, western side of the constellation. Sure. About one tenth sure. the distance from Ye Ye Regulus to Aljabar is a cluster with no name. Do you know it? A cluster of stars? I think so. That's what they're asking. Uh, Terry, you can clarify in the chat too to help um, us. If you're talking about if you're talking about this, I think he's talking about oh, this. Oh, there. Yeah. Yeah. So that's actually a galaxy. That's a that's a um, that's a, a dwarf galaxy, kind of a neighbor of our Milky Way, and it's called uh, Leo One. I believe it's Leo One. So I was going to come back to that at the end. Oops, let me just oh, this. sorry for jumping ahead. No, no, that's a, that's a good question. Love love it. So let's see. I think yeah, it's yeah, and we we landed on what was Terry was asking yeah, for us. Leo One. So it's uh, also known as the Regulus Dwarf Galaxy. It's about distance. I don't know if I put the distance in here, but really tough to see though, because Regulus is very bright. So um, you, I, I wrote this up in uh, Sky News last year, where if you hide Regulus outside the field of view, you might be able to pick up the faint galaxy. So yeah, good question. Cool. Anything else uh, before I go on? Not right now, as always, feel free to ask any questions in the chat or in the Q&A, and we will put them in when they make sense. Sure. Sure. Okay. All right. Now, the uh, three stars here that um, form the hindquarters and the tail of the lion are really handy because we're going to use a lot of those to find galaxies here in a little bit. So first up, I've got Zosma. So Zosma is um, the lion's hip. It's a magnitude 2.5 star, so it's relatively bright. It's an A5 star, so it's white in color. It's about twice the diameter of our sun, uh, but it has a very rapid spin. It's spinning about 100 times faster than our sun. So our sun rotates once a month. So it's this one rotates in, what, uh, eight hours or something like that? So that's, that's given it a, an oblate form, so it doesn't have as, as much of a spherical form as our sun. Uh, why do we know that? Because it's fairly close. It's only 55 light years away, so um, astronomers have been able to study it in quite a bit of detail. Uh, down below here, we have Churton. So Churton is Theta Leonis, and it, it forms this nice triangle. It's The name Churton comes from, uh, let's see, Alcaratan, where you can see up here, Alharatan. And that is translated from an expression that means uh, two small ribs. So it's kind of implying that Zosma and Churton are the ribs of the lion, so the north-south um, rib cage of the lion. Uh, the name Coxa, which you might see somewhere, is means the hip. So we have different, different cultures have given different names to these stars. It's a whitish star, another A-class star, spectral class A2 or A5. It's higher in metals. So when we say a star is metal rich, we mean that it's got higher than average concentrations of elements heavier than hydrogen and helium. So all of the other things that, that stars um, get uh, composed of, it's extra rich in those, so metal rich. Uh, this one has about, let's see, 165 light years away. And it's quite a young star maybe only a few hundred million, 500 million years old or so. And we think that it has a circumstellar disk, maybe um, 
you know, either the, the star itself hasn't quite finished forming and cleaning out its neighborhood, or maybe it's, um, you know, got a planetary system forming around. So it's Turton. And last up, we have Denebola. So Denebola is Beta Leonis, although Denebola and Algeba, I think, are almost the same brightness. And depending on a little bit of variability, they may actually even trade rankings in terms of the brightness in the constellation. Um, the name Denebola comes from uh, Denab al Asad, which means the tail of the lion. Although we'll put an put a put an asterisk on that for a second. It's a blue white blue white colored star, a class a three class star. Well, again, quite young, a few hundred million years old. Um, Denebola emits. Uh, more than is typical of infrared radiation. So again, it may be like Churton, another one of these uh, recently formed systems that still has a lot of dust around it. It's only uh, 36 light years away from us, so we know uh, quite a bit of, quite a bit more about it. Um, one fun fact about Denebola is that the dynamics of its motion through the galaxy um, make it likely that it's part of a family of stars that formed from the same cloud or part of the same open cluster long ago. And those stars include a uh, Gomesa, which is the other, the, the dimmer star um, in Canis Minor, the, the other end of Procyon. So both of those stars um, seem to me maybe siblings that have been separated in the interim. So that's kind of a fun fact. Do you know a site for um, color index of stars, like to reference? I guess that's the um, Julian's asking in the chat. Well, so the Stellarium will give you the spectral type in the star here. You can see it says spectral type A3V. Um, if you go and uh, Google, you know, spectral class, stellar spectral classification, you can find, you know, the um, temperatures and colors associated with each one. Um, I've also got the, the colors tweaked up in Stellarium so that the color of the stars are emphasized. That's why you saw Alturf was, was showing, was displayed as a reddish color because it is a red type star. So you can do it that way. I'm not sure if that answers the question. So see when I click on, when I click on Alturf, the text changes into the same color as the star, kind of this, uh, this golden uh, orangey color. But if I click on Denebola, it's more of a white, blue, white star. Does that answer the question, do you think? I think so, yeah. I don't know personally any specific reference other than Googling. <laughs> I know that sounds terrible, but Julian, let us know if we answered it. Yeah, there we did, we answered the question. Excellent. Thank you. So this, one of these stars here that I mentioned um, could, could act as the, uh, the leg of the lion in some, in some uh, pictures, some depictions, um, is Iota Leonis. And it's located, again, it's a reasonably medium bright star, magnitude less than, greater than four. So you should be able to see it naked eye. It's about a palm, less than a palm's width from Churton, kind of below and between Churton and Denebola. And um, you'll see it in Stellarium labeled as Tsitsang, and Stellarium does, sometimes does some funny things with, with its labeling of objects, but uh, Seed Sang is a, comes from the Chinese astronomy and it's the name for the second general because this star is part of a, a Chinese constellation to do with, um, what did I say, the Supreme Palace enclosure in classical Chinese astronomy. So Seed Sang is a, an F3 type star. So it's, it's transiting from the white type to the yellow. So it's kind of a creamy yellow or warm yellow star. Um, it's 79 light years away. It's got a partner. If you zoom in on, I'm not sure if Stellarium will show the partner here. Here it comes. There you go. So it's a close in double star that you can check out. Your telescope will, will split it. And they're about, uh, they're about 80 light years. Um, we think that we think that there's a third companion orbiting the this, this set uh, about every 200 years or so. Those are uh, be a spectroscopic um, additional star in that system. So that's Iota or Tsitsang. And we'll remember these, we'll come back and use this again here in a bit for deep sky objects. And next up we have Rho. So Rho is the other potential foot of the lion. 
And it's a little bit dimmer, magnitude 3.8, which can make it a little tougher to see from the suburbs with just your eyes. But uh, what's cool about it is that it's a actually, it's a blue white super giant star of class B1. So the first is O and then B. Um, 24,200 24, Kelvin is the photosphere temperature of the star, which is one of the hottest stars in the constellation. And look at this, it's 5,400 light years away. It's one of the farthest um, uh, major stars of the constellation from us. Um, it's only about 23 times the mass of the sun, but it's emitting almost 100,000 times the luminosity of the sun. So it's really impressive despite its sort of modest appearance. So that's kind of a neat one to, to look out for. Uh, let's see, where's Zubra? Zubra is up here. So Zubra is kind of above the tail. It's also known as 72 Leonis. This is a very another one of these very red colored stars. So if you're looking at it through your telescope or your binoculars, see if you can notice the red tint again, just above Zosma. 960 light years away almost. Now, here's the fun part. So if you look at the relationship between Leo and Coma, Coma has this set square tape type shape. And at the northwestern end of the constellation, there's a cluster of stars called Malat 111 or the coma cluster of stars, as opposed to the coma cluster of galaxies. This, this I'm just zooming in on the coma cluster of stars. Long ago, this was considered the tuft on the end of the lion's tail. So before these stars got assigned to coma, uh, Leo extended in next door, and that was the tuft at the end of the lion's tail. So you could, they would have maybe connected a few more of these other stars to give them a curly tail coming up. So I thought that was a neat fun fact about Malat. Uh, just to finish up on the stars, so here's this lion's den section that I mentioned. And again, if you've got binoculars, you can pick up that you've got all of these stars, they're all about fourth magnitude, between fourth and fifth magnitude. So we've got Sigma, Tau, Upsilon, Epsilon, um, Phi, and then P and D. So when they run out of Greek letters, then they get into regular Roman letters. And they form this kind of a neat ring that I think looks like a cave, and it's about a fist, a fist's diameter across. So next time you're out on a clear night, um, see if you can find the lion's den sitting under the lion. I don't know if that's the official name. I'm just I'm just saying it is. That's what I'm called. Looks like a happy face to me. I don't Does know it? why. Leo, yeah. Could Al, be. and yeah. D yeah. eyes. <laughs> I don't know. Well. The proof is in the pudding. So any, if anybody checks it out, they can give us a report back and see what they decide. Every, every yes, episode. please. Next insider's guide. Tell me what it actually looks like in the sky. <laughs> All right. So let's look at some of the interesting stars. I'm just going to bring up my bookmarks here and pull back up. So I, we teased in our description uh, something about Star Trek. I think we mentioned Star Trek. And there's actually a red dwarf star in Leo called Wolf 359. So where's my Wolf 359? So let me show you where it is. Now, there we go, Wolf 359. So Wolf 539 is kind of down here near the, the lion's den section. Um, it's faint though. So the star uh, Wolf 539, Wolf 359 is also known as Cian Leonis. It's, it's a red dwarf star. It's quite faint. Um, I think I got a picture of it. I'm not sure if I have a hand. You have but someone in the chat it. that recognizes it. So yeah. you got it. <laughs> so it's only 9% of the sun's mass. It's, that's barely enough for it to be fusing hydrogen. So it's just, just barely made it as a star. It's class M6.6. So I'm not, I'm not actually pointing at the star right now. Right? Let me just do this and see if I can use Stellarium to get the actual object. Here we go. Yeah, so it's kind of a special object. And depending on how many cat star catalogs you've added to your Stellarium, you may, you may not have, um, it may not appear in yours, but you can certainly uh, do some look online. So, um, it's really close. It's only 7.8 light years away. I think it's the fifth closest star to us that we know of. And because of that, it's 
inspired science fiction, right? Science fiction creators. So you'll know that Wolf 359 is the site of the, the battle with the Borg from Star Trek in the year 2367. So Wolf, the battle of Wolf 359, that's the star they're talking about. Um, as, a, as an M-class star, it's known to emit lots of flares, X-ray flares, gamma ray bursts, gamma ray flares, not gamma ray bursts, gamma ray flares. And uh, you may have heard about the TRAPPIST-1 star system where you have seven Earth-sized planets around one of these M-class stars. But astronomers are a little bit leery about proposing life there because these red dwarf stars do tend to be violent and you get these, these um, blasts of infrared and gamma rays. So um, Wolf 359 would be among those. Um, it's named for German astronomer Max Wolf, who measured its higher proper motion, uh, high proper motion in 1917. And he actually created a list of many Wolf stars. So Wolf 359 is just one of them. Uh, he used astrophotography to track its pr progress. So. We already know that it's got exoplanets. I'm not sure how many off the top of my head, but this is definitely going to be a great James, James um, JWST target, James Webb Space Telescope target once it's uh, up and running. So that's not something that you know you can pick up your binoculars and look at, but it's cool to know it's there, kind of here underneath the stomach of the lion, Wolf 359. Any questions? I'll keep going. Um, we have, I think we just got one. Um, we got a couple more about general and stellari st stellarium in general. I'm sorry. Uh, one was, I only have the app. I can't see the star lore. Uh, I'm just going to plug in here. If you're more, if you're interested in using, learning about all the different ways you can use stellarium, we have a free series of courses, um, for RASC members, uh, on the, hosted online that teaches you from I've never opened Solarium before to I can do everything that Chris can do. Um, so that is, you can find that on RAS.ca. But Chris, do you know if there's any um, star lore in the Solarium app? Do you have much experience with that? Uh, yes. So this, the paid, there's a paid Stellarium app for phones and tablets, and it does have a limited number of uh, star cultures in it. Definitely. There may only be a half dozen or 10 or something like that, but there are, they are there. All right, and one more, um, oh, yes, one more about the Solarium. We do, we are also releasing a Solarium mobile course as well. Um, and Larry's asking, is there an observing list somewhere out there with all the stars mentioned in sci-fi stuff or like all the stars in Star Trek or? Well, Jenna, before your time, Samantha, Jenna and I did a whole Insider's Guide episode on astronomy and science fiction, and we went through a bunch of them. So there like, you go. And well, we have like, all our like, Insider's yeah. Guide episode. And if you want to go on ras.ca slash insider's guide, and you can search through the descriptions of all our previous episodes, just control F and find the sci-fi, and then you'll find that episode. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. I think that's it for the questions right now. <laughs> so I was actually, I was actually going to propose that our next Insider's Guide session be on um, doing more with Stellarium. So I would actually slow down and show people how I'm doing some of these things if, if folks are interested in that. So we did a, we did a how to install it and use it in basic form, but I think I can share um, some tips on how to do a little bit more with it for folks interested. All right, other interesting stars in Leo. Next one I've got on my list is a star named R. Leonis. And R. Leonis is down here near Regulus. And this star is a double star. It's a Myra type variable star. If I bring up the, I'm just gonna bring up the uh, deep sky image here, the deep, deep sky survey image for it. And you'll see how cool and red it is. So it's actually a, pulsating variable star. It varies over a wide range. So it varies from magnitude 4.4, which is kind of close to naked eye limit when it's brightest, all the way down to you need a telescope, magnitude 11.3, on a cycle of 312 days. And uh, I didn't happen to look up where it is in the cycle right now, but um, 
Samantha could look up the link to the um, American Association of Variable Star Observers website, AABSL, and you can you can type, there's a search bar, you can type in R. Leonis and it'll actually plot for you. There's a way of plotting a light curve for it to tell you where it's at. Um, if we have time, I can look it up. But, uh, I can look it up. Leonis. I will send it in the chat. Yeah. Um, now, Stellarium is reporting 10.3, but I don't know if that's, that's not meant to be current. That's just sort of, I think that's just what's in the database that they, uh, that they use. Uh, so it's got um it's got a the primary star the one that gets up to 4.4 4.4 4.5 is the primary star and then it's got a little companion star which I'll just reveal here as you can see next to it so the companion star is uh, magnitude 6.3 and we think that these are orbiting what they're about uh, 300 light years away 290 light years away so so that's R. Leonis, and it's located. So you're talking about um, some stars that emit some pretty cool uh, wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation. Um, someone's asking, do we have to protect our eyes from this? I know we protect our eyes from the sun, or are they just so far away that it's not an issue? So the, the dangerous wavelengths are really the ultraviolet, the ones that we worry about the sunlight doing to us. Um, you know, when you're looking at when you're looking at the sun, when you're not looking at the sun during an eclipse, the thing everybody's worrying about is mainly the the ultraviolet sort of high energy rays. Um, we're not. I mean, it is bright, but that's not what's doing the damage. It's kind of the high energy rays wavelengths. So yes, no. For for looking at stars, they're far enough away. You don't have to worry, even in a telescope. But that's a neat question. Never been asked that question before. I know. I always think of Gammon and the Hulk destroying things. So thank yeah. goodness we're, we're, we're safe. Okay. Another cool one is a 54 Leonis. It's up above the lion's back here. This is a nice little double star as well. It's, uh, let's see, 290 light years away. It's, um, Let's see, 83, 54 Leonis. Yeah, magnitude, the brightest star is magnitude four and a half. And then it's got a magnitude six star nearby. Yeah, yeah. So that's 54 Leonis. I may have said that our Leonis is a double. It's not. It's this one, 54 Leonis, that has the double. So there you go. Uh, 83 Leonis is another neat one. There's 83. 83 is, this one's neat because when you look at this one in a telescope, you get two double stars for one price. So we have 83 Leonis and the star Tau. Tau. Tau is part of our lion's den. That's where that is. So both of them are, have a bright star with a little companion. So we have Tau as a bright star with a little companion. And then 83 Leo has a bright star with a little companion. I'm just going to zoom in a little more. I'll pick a stronger eyepiece so you can see it. So there's there's 83 Leonis, and then oops, there's Tau Leonis. That's using a strong eyepiece. You can't keep them both together, but in a weaker eyepiece, you can you can frame it so that they both fit together. I'll go back to my plossal here. So that's, that's down here near. So you can use, you can use your Churton, you can use your Tsitsong and go down here. You can use your uh, new Virginis as well, but basically you're looking at the Lion's Den region. And a couple more, I got 88, and then we'll switch to the deep sky objects here in a second. So 88 Leonis is a neat one. It's down here midway between the Nebula and Churton. It's a, it's a double. Now it's not a triple. Stellarium shows three, but it's really only two in your eyepiece. You'll only see two. So again, that's a, that's a combination of multiple star um, catalogs being displayed by Stellarium at once. And 90. So 90 is inside the tail, about halfway between Zosma and Denebola. And that's kind of a mixed, a matched pair. So that one's fairly close. Uh, there we go. So those are B-class stars. Those are the kind of a blue-white colored stars. 
And finally, uh, 93, I think was my last one that I had in my list here. Oh, 93, yeah, 93 is triple. You've got three stars. And that one is up here, kind of above Zosma and Denebola. And we'll come back to some galaxies in this area as well again. And finally, I had one left in double stars. This is called Struve 1426. So when you see that, that capital sigma, Greek letter sigma, in a description that's for um, Struve, the astronomer who was cataloging double stars, and he picked this one. This one's neat because you got a triple again. So a close in pair and then a wider pair. So if at first you only see two, put a stronger eyepiece in and see if you can get all three. So that's a neat one as well. Um, I can't remember, one of these is in the uh, RASC double star program. So I'll try to figure out which one of those is before we're done. So those are your double stars and now we'll switch to deep sky objects. Any questions though, before I do that? Um, yes, how, oh. so we, uh, we have questions about Solarium. I'm going to save this one, Terry, for next week, next episode. Um, I will put that in the bank and I maybe will send out a little, uh, blip of questions you may have ahead of time for Chris to prepare, uh, about Solarium. Um, is there triple stars or double stars, stars with three stars? Are there triple star systems? Yeah, so that the last one I just showed was a triple star. Okay. I think it was, I think it was, uh, was it 93? There's three, you'll get three in the view and then the Strew 1426, I think. Uh, yeah, this is, a, this is a triple system. So when you first look, you'll see maybe this four, but if you zoom in, this one splits. So that's considered a triple star system. And you'll need a strong eyepiece to see them split apart. Okay, so 26 millimeter plus is no good. You need to really, really zoom in to see them. All right, let's talk about galaxies. Mainly because that's all that's left. I mean, in terms of deep sky objects, uh, Leo is part of the realm of the galaxies. So that's the only really um, type of, of deep sky object that it contains. So Leo has, let's see, five Messier objects, which we've talked about in our Messier minutes. And those are distributed below the lion's stomach here. And first up is we've got the Leo triplet. It's called the Leo triplet because there are three galaxies in here, but only two of them are Messiers. That's why I'm only displaying Messiers with symbols right now. So that's why you're only seeing two with labels and one without. Now, what's neat is that this is easy to find if you look halfway between Chirton and Tsitsang. So that's that iota star. So if you point your finder scope or your telescope, even just eyeballing it with a low power eyepiece, halfway between these two stars, and these two stars are both uh, naked eye stars, then you'll get the Leo triplet. So here's the Leo triplet as seen through a low power eyepiece at about, what is this, 35 power through a six inch telescope. These galaxies are relatively bright. Um, so it makes them great for beginners, great for, you know, if you've got um, a dark backyard, even if you're in the suburbs, you could probably see them. Um, we've got M65 and M66, which are spiral galaxies. And then we've got this non-Messier galaxy, which is called NGC 3384, or the hamburger. And you might notice that it looks like a hamburger if you zoom in. Let's zoom in on it here a little bit more. So it's got the, you know, the patty in the middle and the, the fluffy bun around it. So that's neat. And you'll notice, you know, if you've got uh, good scene conditions at a dark sky, you'll notice that the, it's kind of an, um, uh, rectangular shape rather than the tapered ends that you usually see with galaxies. Let me just bring on the extra NGC objects here. It reminds me of slightly with the, the dust going across of the Sombrero galaxy we talked about earlier. Yeah, 
Yeah, Absolutely same different, kind of thing. But... Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't didn't know. So these are these are all about. Let's see, distance, forty five million light years away. And this one doesn't show it. I'm not sure if this one does. Yeah, 35, 36 million light years away. So that's the Leo triplet. So those are a great set of targets to look for. Um, so then we've got also, and I'm just going to simplify this view again just to make it less overwhelming. So there's your trick to finding the Leo triplet. Your trick to finding the other three Messiers is to find your Churton and Regulus, go halfway between and about two finger widths below. And if you do that, you'll pick up this group of galaxies, M95, M96, and M105. Um, you might also hear these called the Leo group. And there's also another galaxy here as well. So you can see there are actually more than just these three. There's another one here, and there are a few here and there. Remember, if Stellarium is not showing you, Stellarium only loads particular pictures for particular galaxies. If you want to see everything, then you need to switch on the DSS button, and it can reveal more galaxy pictures for you. So that's something, that's a trick you can use. So that, those are, that set is easy to find. And uh, the, um, the other thing that's neat is that RASC has our own set of finest NGC objects, 110 finest NGC objects that are meant to be a supplement to the Messier, so another set to look at. And that Hamburger Galaxy was one of the finest NGCs, number 55. So we'll come back to that here in a bit. And then I'll mention a couple more as we go. So those are your five Messiers, and those so far one of your finest NGCs. The next really neat one is one of my favorites, and I just heard today for the first time somebody's name for it. So if you go up to the sickle, find all turf, and then go down just a little bit, how much here? So a thumb's width or so, south of all turf, there's a galaxy sitting right here, which I'll zoom in on. And this is really, really neat. This is NGC uh, 2905, where is it here? 2903. So this is not part of Messier's list, although it's, it's as big and as bright as many of the Messier galaxies. We don't know why you skipped it. There's your view through your 26 millimeter fossil. I've seen this one in my, uh, my big reflector telescope uh, from a pretty dark site, medium dark site. And it was very noticeable, very easy to find, very easy to see. Um, I wrote about this in uh, Sky News a while ago as well. So somebody, um, when I mentioned this in our announcement of our uh, Insider's Guide today, uh, a reader on Facebook replied with a picture of that he had taken of it saying that he called it the lion's tongue. So that's new to me, but that's kind of cool. So this galaxy is uh, ninth magnitude. It's brighter because it's oblique. So it's tilted, not quite edge on, but it's oblique to us. You can see it in smaller telescopes. Um, it's got a nice uh, in, you know, bright nucleus and then um, varying amounts of arms will appear depending on how big your, your aperture is in your telescope and how dark your sight is. So, uh, so that's a neat one that you can look for. NGC 2903. Oh, and there's also a globular cluster that's a big telescopes can pick up on this one. Uh, yeah. All right, next one up, and that's finest NGC 54, by the way. Next up is 3521. So NGC 3521 is a little bit smaller. This is also ninth magnitude star, a nice man ninth magnitude galaxy. Where it is, is down here in the lion's den. And so um, when I wrote this one up in Sky News, I said, start it at New Virginis and Zabijaba, and then just follow the curl around, and then boom. It's about skip, 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 and then you can find the galaxy. So that's 3521. It's finest Gen GC 56. So if anybody wants to earn their, um, their certificate for the finest Gen GCs, 
There's uh, three of them I've already mentioned in Leo. And this one you're gonna notice some asymmetry on. So there's a dark half and a brighter half. So that's kind of a neat aspect of it. Uh, next up, 3607. Now again, see how there's no picture shown for it in Stellarium, but if I go to the DSS and click on that, then it'll load up the picture for me. So this is an elliptical galaxy and there's actually two of them in the same view. So this is NGC, a uh, finest NGC 57. It's a little bit brighter than Stellarium report. So the, I'm using a couple of versions ago of Stellarium. The last version that just came out, they fixed a number of the errors in the um, galaxy magnitudes, especially in the messy objects. So this one's got uh, three other galaxies in the group. It's called the LEO2 group. They're all, all, all the galaxies in this group are about 73 million light years away. So this would make a neat astrophotography target because you'll pick up all kinds of other little galaxies around it if you do that. All right, there's one a Caldwell object. We talked about the Caldwells a while ago. Caldwells are um, another set of 110 favorites of Sir Patrick Moore, the British astronomer. And he liked Caldwell for number 40 or NGC 3626. And this one, as you can see, is small, but kind of bright. So it's a little bit tiny in the, uh, in the six inch um, reflector with the 26 millimeter fossil, but it's a lenticular galaxy. So it's kind of the shape of a spiral galaxy, but it doesn't really have the arms that you expect from a spiral galaxy. So what's neat about this one is that even though it's not that exciting to look at, astrophysically, it's very interesting because the galaxy's stars are rotating, the disk is rotating in one direction, but the gas in the galaxy is rotating in the opposite direction at the same time. So, it's, so we, they, astronomers think it's because of a merger that may have happened that somehow caused it to, to spin in a funny way. All right, now, another couple, and that one's up here in the, the tail of the line. Okay, a couple more here we have. Leo Quartet, here's my Leo Quartet here. So Leo Quartet is in the neck of the lion between Algeba and Atafera. So you can aim your telescope midway between those two bright stars and look for a cool group of galaxies here. I'll just center that in the, it's a little bit faint. Let me just bring up the DSS image so you can make it a little brighter. So there are four NGC galaxies in here, all within 15 arc minutes of each other. And they're all kind of different shapes. So there's, you can see, there we go. There's elliptical, there's almost like a hamburger, then there's a distorted galaxy with kind of this L shape and then a spiral here. So that's a neat one to look for. A good imaging target, Leo Quartet. Okay. So how's our time for, for you? I'll stop there for a second. Doing good. Any questions? Any questions? Leo's got a lot of galaxy clusters. I don't even know if that's a term, but yeah. A lot of good. Uh, Did you just point? I'm going to spend a couple nights just looking at Leo. This is such a treasure trove. So the rule of thumb is that the Messiers are going to be the easiest. The finest NGC and the Caldwell will be medium easy, not quite maybe as easy, but, but pretty much. Some better, some worse, if you like. And then we get into kind of the, the ones that are more of a challenge. So we have David Levy's Deep Sky Gems that are also listed in the Observer's Handbook of Rask. And he's got some, uh, some in Leo as well. Uh, here's a neat one, 3705. Let's see, where's my 3705? Yeah, here's my 3705. I'll just add the deep sky image on this one. So this is a nice oblique spiral galaxy. Okay, this we one have is a question also- about, Oh, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Um, just before we get too deep into this one, we had a question about that warped galaxy. Do we know what would create that warp shape or do we have any Suspe uh, suspicions of what caused it? 
Yeah, absolutely. So, um, especially in the Virgo cluster where you've got a lot of galaxies near enough to one another to be exerting gravitational pulls on each other, they're also kind of in motion and there'll be points where our two galaxies will pass near one another and they'll pull on each other with their gravity and they can definitely warp and distort each other's shape by doing that. In fact, if you remember when we talked about Markarian's chain, so the, the big ellipticals, so the big ellipticals we think are galaxies that have already coalesced out of more than one original galaxy, perhaps spirals, it doesn't matter, but when they merge, they lose all of their original structures. They just end up basically as an egg shape or a spherical mass. But you can see in the uh, Markarian's chain here, there's a galaxy here that's being distorted due to its proximity to a neighboring galaxy, or maybe it's, it's flown past a galaxy in the past and gotten pulled, pulled away. So yeah, so that happens all the time. So um, there's, a, there's a catalog called ARP, A-R-P. Let me see if I can bring this up here and show you. So Halton ARP, listed the galaxies that he thought were peculiar. So they either had a warped disk or maybe they were a funny shape. And uh, if you search for ARP galaxies, you can find all kinds of examples of those. So yeah, good question. Let's go back to Leo here. The Atlas of Particular Galaxies? Yeah, peculiar. Peculiar. Yeah. And this is why I am not an English major. You can, you can <laughs> think of it as a, a, a real peculiar galaxy, ARP. I just sent a link to the Wikipedia article for everybody in the chat. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so this one, this one is um, one that I might write up one of these days, uh, NGC 3705, it's a magnitude 11. It's kind of near that. Iota star. So there's our Leo triplet. There's our Iota star. And then that one 3705 is just down here, getting into the lion's den area. Uh, 3640 is another neat one. This is an elliptical galaxy. And again, it's, it's kind of an easier to see galaxy, but ellipticals aren't all that exciting to people because they're sort of featureless, but it's one that you could, you could try to um, successfully see. Uh, the Abel, where's my Abel? Abel 1367. So this is actually a galaxy cluster. It's not something really for observational astronomers because it's, it's a lot of little faint galaxies all grouped together. So it's a true galaxy cluster, but it, it makes a great imaging target for folks interested in that. And it's located, so let me just simplify the view here. Here we go. So it's located near this star 93 Leonis, which was one of the doubles I mentioned. And you can, you can locate it by making a triangle out of Zosma and Denebola. So it's kind of sitting up here above the lion's um, haunches. So that's called Abel 367. Uh, just a couple more and then we'll finish. Uh, let's see, 3810. So 3810 is one of David Lee's galaxies. And again, it's, it's kind of tiny. You can see it's kind of small in that typical field of view I've been using, but it's a nice little spiral galaxy. Uh, 2964, another of David Levy's recommendations. And this is a pair of galaxies that are actually interacting with each other. So these would be, these would be possibly in, in the ARP catalog. So these two on closer inspection will be shown to be a little bit non-standard because of their, their interaction with each other. And again, in the typical view, you can see they're pretty small. Uh, 33, 3226 is I think the last one I've got here of the deep sky gems. And this one's, this one's neat because it's easy to find. Let me just turn off this for a second. So here's El Gieba, the throat of the lion. And I wrote this one up in Sky News because if you put El Gieba in your telescope and the galaxies are just outside the field of view, 
So if you can actually fit them both together. You might find that, that the star outshines the galaxies too much. So if you do find that's the case, just hide Algeba just outside, and then you can brighten the galaxy. So that's a pair of galaxies that are tucked there right next. So it makes it so easy to find it by just aiming a little bit to the east of Algeba. Uh, that was pretty well it. And then I was gonna talk about Leo one, which somebody noted as kind of this faint smudge, and that's actually a dwarf galaxy. So those are that gives you lots of uh, lots to look at in Leo. Any we other have questions? a what? Yes, uh, regarding the large galaxy missed by earlier astronomers that were close together, by current movement directions detected, is it possible that somewhere hidden behind? Some were hidden behind others at the time, or it may not be logically deducted. So I am interpreting this question as did the galaxies, I guess, move, and that's why they didn't see the difference, or was it just their um, optics? So didn't see the difference in in which again? Um, there's it, large galaxies really... missed by early astronomers. So by current movement directions detected, is it possible that they were hidden behind other galaxies? at the time that these early astronomers were looking at it. Okay, so we only started looking at galaxies with telescopes um, in this, you know, within a few decades of, of telescopes being kind of perfected for astronomy. So the 1600s um, and since then, uh, galaxies have not changed their positions in that interval in the last 400 years. So anything that we're discovering now or since then is just because we're using better and better telescopes and we're taking photographs where we couldn't do that before. So you've seen the Hubble deep field image where they took an empty part of the sky. Now you can take an empty patch of the sky and zoom in on it. And if you bring up the deep sky image, you know, chances are there are galaxies here. And the longer you stare at it, the more galaxies will be revealed. They'll be tiny and distant, but they're, but they're there. You know, there are galaxies here. So yeah, so they don't they don't move around since that they could hide from one another. But what is true is that I'm, I'm, we're sure that there are galaxies that are we're never going to see because they're blocked by our own Milky Way because there's just so much intervening gas and dust. Does that answer the question? I hope so. I, I my interpreting. I hope it did. Let us know if it didn't. Um, but thank you for asking that because yeah. I guess it's a lot slower movement than we are used to over millennia <laughs> versus a couple hundred years. Um, yeah. Yes, it did answer your question. Great. Any other questions about our Leo deep dive? So what are, what are people most interested to check out now that uh, it's going to be clear, optically clear skies and warmer weather this week? So what are people's goals? Are we going to try to catch some of these Messier objects? Or uh, are we gonna find Leo? Definitely Mercury, we got Mercury down. Yeah. Um, I still wanna hit that Virgo, um, Carrion's chain, just point my telescope there and see what I see. <laughs> yeah, Mer Mercurian's chain is way easier than you think. As long as you've got a moonless night and you don't have, you know, lots of lots of ambient light around you, um, you don't need a giant telescope. Just do that trick of aiming it between Denebola and and Demaya tricks, and you'll pick it up. And once you're there, you can just trace it along. Oh, we have people saying looking for Me Messier, the tree on Quartet. Um, looking more closely at double, triple star combinations. I haven't looked at those before. Nice. Um, I also, if you are interested in uh, going a little deeper into Solarium, like Chris was talking about, um, and you see things that you want to know how he does, the, ca the uh, catch for that is check out the previous Solarium episode because we're not going to be repeating stuff from there. Right, Chris? <laughs> um, yeah. So the very first one I did, um, we got everybody started by 
explaining how to install it and, and configure it and use it in the basic form. So that's at the top of the, if you sort by, by age, it's the oldest one we did. And then mm -hmm. this one, I thought I would jump into, not into the deep end, but just into the medium shallow end and just show some of the ways that I've manipulate the system so you can do more. So if you have any burning questions about that end that we're not guaranteeing we'll answer them, we'll just consider for a thing, you can email me at outreach at ras.ca um, and I will forward them on to Chris and maybe we'll go dive into it. Um, yeah, Cause I, I've already, I already took the, there's a few already here. So I know people probably have some burning questions. <laughs> yeah, one, one thing to remark on, you know, well, Blake Nancaro is managing the um, Stellarium training, which is fantastic. And he's got a real yeah. curriculum that he's developed and some good instructors, but he's, he's teaching them as small class groups, small groups of people, um, individual classes, whereas, and they're not being, you know, posted on YouTube or something like that. Whereas what we're going to do with me and uh, Samantha is something that'll get posted on YouTube and uh, can be referenced anytime you want. Anybody mm -hmm. can see it. So. I definitely suggest taking the Stellarum class. I took the beginner and I want to take the advanced coming up. And even as someone who's used the basics of Stellarum, I miss some very simple things, but I'm very happy I know them. And yeah, RASC members free. It's an excellently put together course. So yeah. um, just before we go, um, NGC, somebody's looking for NGC 46, 44, 46, 47, almost overlapping with M60, has a Newly discovered bright supernova. There's a little astronomy for you, astronomy news. And we have a lot of thank you. Thank you all for showing up every two weeks to listen to us chat about space. Your appreciation keeps us going. Um, really got to give a hand to Chris for all he does too for this. So. Well, it's it's. Not done to just about me, but you know, okay. if if you see a rascal doing something, then you appreciate, you know, let somebody know. We all we all should um, lift each other up and recognize uh, what everybody does to make the society greater. So, you know, spread the word. As I say, we only have about five staff that run that are paid to do this. Everything else is just your passion for astronomy and volunteers for it. So, couldn't do it without all of you and. Um, volunteers and everything. I appreciate everything everyone does. Okay. And with that pleasant feel good note, I guess we can say goodbye. Chris, would you like to sign off? Keep looking up everybody. <laughs>